hit with such impact that it moved my vehicle, the vehicle that was behind me. And you could see them trying to swerve, but it had no head, no wings, no feet. My name is co-host Diego. And if we're talking about how I became interested in cryptids and Bigfoot, even paranormal, it comes from many years of life experience. And it wasn't up until I became later in life when I was doing another podcast with a partner of mine in 2020, um, during the pandemic, we're all kind of forced to stay in the house and we could not do events. So we started doing a podcast where we covered a lot of like sports entertainment. And then I slowly started creeping in a lot of the paranormal encrypted information. And um, ever since I was young, I saw this book, funny enough, and, and I just talked to somebody the other day about this book that nobody can seems to locate, which covers three subjects, which was Loch Ness, Bigfoot and UFO. I found this back Oh my, in, in very early 80s elementary school. And the whole Bigfoot UFO thing really struck me because since I've been three years old, I've been having experiences mostly with paranormal supernatural forces. But Bigfoot's one of those things that, you know, I've always been interested in. And, and one of the purpose of the show that I have, uh, let's find out with co host Diego, is really not much about me, but is technically is because I'm on a journey to find answers to questions I have about life at why are these things happening why are these sightings who's having paranormal experiences who's encountering cryptids so when i had the guests on i, I kind of write down a lot of this information and keep it in my mind and it's i learned so much from them that it helps me find answers to what these creatures could possibly be and not just strictly bigfoot but also in paranormal and also ufologists one of the big things also that i'm into well, let's uh, let's just start with Bigfoot, and then we'll make our way to these other cryptids, uh, including uh, the the subject of UFOs and the aliens that might be aboard those craft. Um, so, have you ha do you do any Bigfoot research, or is it mostly just the interviews you do on your show? Uh, and that's a great question, and it's a couple of times the guests have called me on. It's like I'm not out there in the field, out in the woods, and things like that. So, I do a lot of uh, research. I don't do investigations. I do research. Um, due to time constraints, the kind of job that I have, and I'm a family man, husband, and a husband first. So usually those kind of things I really can't do. But uh, as far as the things that I've learned, and I don't have any type of experience, only once, and I'll, and I'll give you this real quick because I kind of feel it might fall into that. And hoping that either you or your viewers can help me find an answer to this. So this is something that happened. I'm going to say late 2020 is winter time. There's this one road I take to work. I work in the in DC and I take Route 50. So when you get to a certain point in Route 50, you're going to run to three towns, uh, Upperville, Middleburg, and Aldi. There's a lot of money in these towns, a lot of old money. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's it's horse country. There's a lot of there's a there's a lot of forest, a lot of woods, a lot of acres of of just either farmland and horse stuff like that, right? So one day in these towns uh, that you go into town, you blink, it's gone. You go 25 miles an hour, then 30, towns get smaller. There's this one part in this town, it's between Upperville, Upperville and um, Middleburg, where you just now leave in town and then all of a sudden there's, there's woods everywhere and uh, very beautiful scenery. Out of nowhere, to my left, an object was propelled towards my vehicle. Now, it, it's one of those things because I know that there's been cases where people who have experienced where uh, I suppose a Bigfoot has thrown rocks or stones towards individuals to warn them away. This is something new to me at the time. Uh, I've never experienced such a thing. Um, I do believe this might fall into that. Now, it wasn't a rock or a tree trunk or anything like that. The object that was hurled towards my car, which I don't think a person could have done, it flew towards my windshield on the top right of the passenger side. Uh, the interesting fact about this, this certain thing that was thrown towards my vehicle, it hit with such impact. Not only did it move my vehicle, the vehicle that was behind me, another um, close to my car, and you could see them trying to swerve. The sound was so loud, it echoed through my car. I thought this thing was going to bust through my windshield. And the glimpse that I got is 
if you can picture on Thanksgiving when you go to the grocery store, think about the biggest butterball turkey you could find, right? But this thing had feathers, but it had no head, no wings, no feet. It's almost like it was torn off of them. But this giant feathered object was hurled towards my car. And like I said earlier, it made such a sound, it had such an impact and the car behind me swerved as well. So I, I, in my opinion, it may fall into that. Virginia is not really known, at least not in that area, to have a lot of those types of societies. Virginia is very big on on the paranormal parts. Um, Bigfoot, not so much, unless you go south of Richmond. That's kind of big with uh, Bigfoot or, or werewolves and things like that. But is one of those things who I finally had some sort of experience like that. And I don't know, judging from everybody else's experience, if it falls under that, but I'm pretty convinced that's exactly what it was. Now, I didn't see any shadows in the woods, um, but I don't think a person could have tossed something like that that far away. You don't think it could have been a, a bird just that in flight somehow? or You know, and that's the thing that I would have thought at first, but the fact that I couldn't... It didn't have no. It didn't have a, a no neck or a head, no feet, no wings. Think of it. Um, Northern Virginia, especially, uh, they have a lot of. Um, I'm not gonna say problems, but have a big population of um, Canadian geese. So it looks something similar to a Canadian geese as far as with with the, with the feathers and the, with the shape of the body itself. But it had no head, uh, no feet, no wings. Uh, one would have thought maybe an owl would have crossed it and I would have hit, but it, it wasn't anything like that. I'm pretty convinced that it's exactly was a very large Canadian geese type of thing that for some reason got hurled towards my car. Maybe I disturbed it or I like to keep awake and I like to drive with my music kind of loud. You know, I know it's very disturbing to the to the neighbors in that street, but you know, it, it is what it is. But I, I believe that maybe I may have upset this thing and it just threw whatever it caught for lunch or breakfast that morning, right in my car. And how fast were you going down the road? It would have been probably because that town, very small, so you're limited to around 25 miles an hour. Then once it opens back up, it goes 35, then 50. So I was around the 25, 35 area and uh, not that fast at all, but but the, um, the impact it had on the vehicle was enough to not only make such a loud noise, but to shake it. Thankfully, the windshield was not shattered, which I thought that's exactly what would have happened, but it did not. Um, and from the area where this thing would have had to come out of, what describe that to me? Sure. So as you're leaving that very small town, you'll start seeing more um more trees and more farmland of sorts. Um so just outside of that town, when it opens up, you can see how something like that could hide in, 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 the, in the bush or hide in the trees. It was towards my left. So it, was, it flew from my left all the way. And then when it hit to the top right hand corner of that windshield. And it, it just happens so fast that it takes time for you to process it, what really happened. Um, I would have thought something different if I hadn't seen the vehicle behind me swerve like it did. And I'm, like I said, I'm pretty convinced that this may fall into that category um, of possibly some sort of creature throwing something towards the vehicle. So there was a wooded area, brushy wooded area is what it came out of, right? But you couldn't really, was it dense? You couldn't really see through it or was it, you know, just um, any visibility through that area? No, and that's a great question now because this happened right around... I, I'm a I'm an early bird. I'm up at 4 a.m. I'm on the road by 4:35 o'clock. So this this happened right between the I want to say 4:45 to 5:15 in the morning type because I was I'm so regimented that I can really what depends what time I hit town. I know where I hit it right about the same times. So right about this part of Route 50, I would say what about between 4:45 to 5:15 would this would have happened because it was it was uh, low light. It was dark. But it was a clear night. You can see the stars, a very beautiful scenery. But um, as far as seeing in the woods, it's almost impossible. Because also, Route 50 is known a lot for having very foggy roads. And there was just a slight mist in the morning. But it's you can't really see anything outside of the roads during that time in the morning.
Yeah. So, um, and this was an isolated incident. The only time that something like that has ever happened to you. This would be the only time now there's been times back when I used to travel a lot, when I was an entertainer back in the, in the nineties and two thousands, early two thousands, where you're driving at night. I used to go to a lot of small towns back then. And every once in a while you get a glimpse of something that may or may not have seen. And I mean, it, it could have been something could not have been something, but nothing like this. This is the first time physically outside of a paranormal experience part. This would be the first time where I've experienced something like this. Well, that's interesting. I don't think I've ever heard of uh, something like that going while you're going down the road being being hurled um, at, a, at a car like that, especially from a Bigfoot. You know, it's usually rocks or, you know, some, something simple uh, like that in an area and certainly not when when a car is in in uh, motion. Um, and of course, there's the the normal reporting of, you know, a Bigfoot walking across a road and you know, things like that. But um, it sounds like that would definitely uh, deserve some um, some research um, as to what maybe was taking place. You didn't think about going back to see if you could find whatever it was in the road? No, and it, most likely whatever it was, it may have either been removed by another animal scratching around for food, or it basically might have been run over by several vehicles. If it's some, if it was an animal or something like that, it you, it would have been very little left of it by the time you came back. Yeah, true, probably so. So what else have you encountered out there? Any other stories on Bigfoot before we move on? Actually, that's the only time I've experienced anything like that that would compare. Um, on the show, I've interviewed a lot of guests about talking about their their books or Bigfoot experiences, or they've interviewed other people. They tell me their stories. But for me, this is the only time I've ever encountered something like this. What was the most outstanding interview you've ever done on uh, Bigfoot that impressed you the most? You know, there's been several, and and if I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the list of the folks that I've interviewed, one person in particular comes to mind when he first um, compiled the stories from different investigators. A Tim Holleran, mm -hmm. he uh, at that time, right before he released that book, and he is one of the ones where I felt like I came out knowing a lot more about the subject that I originally knew, and. I've also gone to a lot of the conventions in like Weyer's Cave. Uh, Daniel Benoit puts on a, a great event and listen to a lot of speakers. One in particular, a Kirk Bradford had a great presentation and he looked at it more, I guess, more outside of a Bigfoot and more of a primate type of thing. Um, that's one of the better interviews. I also had him on my show, my first incarnation of that. And Man, I tell you, it's it's one of those things to where I've interviewed different people, and and uh, when I do the convent, when I go to the conventions as a vendor, there are people who think, and there are people who know because of their experiences, and I like to hear those stories. And I recently um, released, not right before you contacted me, a um, there's a gentleman called OS, and he has this display of a of a tree twist which is a fairly huge tree trunk that's been twisted uh, 13 times one way and 13 times the other way and doesn't have any markings of any type of machinery that's been used it looks like it was used by brute force so he was telling me the story behind how he found this at the same time his wife uh, had experiences as well while they were hiking in the carolinas west virginia and virginia I had her on the show and I released the episode last week and it's a pretty interesting story. It's one of the first times where outside of a person who is a, a uh, researcher or investigator or an author where they told me their own personal story, which they never told in public before. And of course I, I use a different name to, you know, just to make sure that nobody knows who she is. And uh, that was a pretty interesting thing that she said. And uh, yeah, this is one of the reasons I do this. The show that I do because um, it's like a personal journey for me to find out what it is that's going on out there. And I have a very open mind, so I'm open to everybody's um, interpretations or opinions about the subject. Sure. Can you share us? Can you share any of her experience with us? I can't. So there was this one time because she shared several stories. The one that stuck out the most to me is so I believe this happened in in, in West Virginia. I'm sorry, in North Carolina. It, 
while they were hiking. So they set up camp and they're very experienced campers. They're not hunters, but they know um, how to properly travel in the woods, how to be prepared, all that stuff. So one night she's in this tent and they started hearing these, these rustlings in the background and, and voices and which wasn't anybody from the camping team that she was with at the time. Uh, later that night, as they're trying to go to sleep, she starts noticing some rustling around her tent. And of course, the first thing you really think about is anybody else from the group there making noise? Are they coming back and forth from the from the woods? All of a sudden, this handprint starts pushing towards the tent, the cloth, and which was very frightening for that person, of course, because it's the the size of the handprint was a lot bigger than what a, a typical humans would be. And that's one of the things that even for me, I know I would be a little alerted myself if that would happen to me in camping. I'm not much of a camper, but if that would ever happen to me, my goodness, you know, you know, what would you really think? And that's one of the things that she went on to tell me several stories. And her husband has stories as well, where one one during these camping trips that she saw a, a figure of a person dressing like a, like a brown colors and coming from the woods rather tall she thought it was either her husband or somebody else who was on that trip but when she confronted them and asked them the questions like are you playing games with me or a joke says i was nowhere near where you were so I'm not really sure what it is that you saw because normally if it were a hunter hunters don't wear those types of colors when they're out there so this thing blended in very well with the forest and she did see this pretty tall figure come out of the woods and she is probably about as close as she ever has to having a, like, a, I don't know, I think within five or 10 feet of this creature. So that was a pretty interesting story she, she shared on my show. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, you know, I, and I've heard a lot of those stories where someone is out in the woods camping and they're asleep and they're, they're suddenly there is this, you know, something is outside the tent. They can hear them moving around. Sometimes they push against them even. They can feel them pushing them to, you know, in on the tent. And, um, you know, that's um, most of them don't leave the tent because it's they feel safer somehow inside. And most of the time, I, I don't know if I've ever heard of them, uh, you know, invading the tent itself, uh, but just kind of just making their presence known sort of or being curious about the tent and what's inside the tent or who's inside the tent. Uh, those are kind of interesting, interesting things. But it has to be very frightening uh, to to be in that situation. Yeah, definitely. And she also shared something. I, I don't, you know, I can't recall if it was on the on the on the recording that we had a couple of weeks ago or not. But she shared to me that she also heard this, um, whatever it was, uh, speaking right. And similar to how she explained it, and you gotta forgive me if I don't get this right. Um, I know you'll know with the um, she compared it to something similar to the Sierra sounds, um, with, I believe that's what it's called, where. It's almost like a, it's called like a samurai talk or it's some sort of the way they talk that it, I mean, undiscernible to us, but it definitely had some sort of language when it was communicating to others. But I believe the Sierra sound, if, if I'm correct, or not, if you correct yeah, me yeah, if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, samurai chatter, I think mm -hmm. they call it chatter. Um, yeah, the Sierra sounds, um, I think is what you're going for that Ron Moore had recorded. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she didn't mention that, but I, I don't know as far how long the, that chatter lasted, but they did hear some whoops later down. And and I might be mixing both stories with um with Judy and her husband OS, but since they're both usually on this on that same trips, um, yeah, they've seen they've seen a lot of things and heard a lot of things. I was very impressed with her story. I had them on. It was actually funny, interesting enough. It was the first time I've had a story like that with somebody sharing it. But that's not an author or an actual field investigator. So that was kind of a bonus for me. And uh, but she, the way she told the story, I was just captivated the whole time. I did very little talking on that show, which is not very normal for me. But uh, yeah, no, it, it was a great interview. Yeah, I uh, primarily my um, interviews are with people who have had some form of an experience. I mean, I do authors, too, like you. Um, but most of the time, you know, people that actually have been, you know, in the woods, either an accidental experience or they're out actually looking for Bigfoot and run into something and have uh, a story to tell. Some of them are kind of scary and some of them are just very gentle, very easy and 
and um, almost become a second nature, normal, you know, kind of experience from their life. But um, I think I would be a little bit scared. No, I would, I would be terrified. I'm not a, I'm not a woodsy kind of guy, but if I were to one day exactly leave my house and do this, I think that, um, I, I don't know how I would act, but I think, uh, I would rely on the experiences of others to, uh, to see how I would act, but, um, yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. So let's move on to other cryptids that, uh, that you have an interest in. Um, Besides Bigfoot, um, what are some of the other areas that uh, that you've had some form of an experience or um, just have taken interest? No, that's a great question. I, the the more I've I've been talking to a lot of people, the more I learn about other cryptids, and there's a lot of lesser known ones as well. But I I tend to stick to mostly the what I call the big two, which is uh Bigfoot and UFOs and that's always interested me and whether some people believe that ufos fall into the cryptids or the supernatural i you know that's kind of muddy right there but as far as ufos wise it's it's been i've never seen one but i'll tell you a, a interesting story about that if you if you don't mind when when i was young and i moved to this country i think i was about six years old so the longer i went I never really read books back then and I couldn't read a Spanish book at all right now. I can speak the language back then. I think I was about seven years old, eight years old, a neighbor of my aunt brought me this book about three or 400 pages written in Spanish and it had a big picture of a gray alien on the front. I'm not really sure because books get translated, you know, they come out in English and get translated in other languages. And something of that book struck me because it, it kind of changed my life. Because it was almost as the minute I opened that book, I was in some sort of a trance because not only did I not read Spanish very well, but I read this book three, 400 pages. I read it all in one night, which is very strange for me. And everything made sense to me. And it was almost like a, um, I was meant to read that book, if that makes any sense. And things just slowly started making more sense at that point. And, but I've never had any type of experience with UFOs. Um, do you remember what was in the book that stood out to you so much that changed your life? Sure. There's, there's one part in it and I believe it was a part where there was an interview with a, with an experiencer and it was, I think the transcript of a, um, of a hypnotic session, hypnotic, uh, regression, I believe. And the way that this witness and experiencer was telling their story it was very freaky because it was so detailed and you can really feel the emotion and the words that were written that it was to me unmistakable that that person was telling the truth. And then from there on, it's just this whole thing just built up to where I became deeper and deeper into this rabbit hole, but I did lose interest later in life. And it wasn't until my early to mid twenties where things just started all over again. And then my journey really kind of began there. What took you back into it after um, after a time? What took you back your interest back to the UFOs? Yeah, well, great question because I, in my opinion, a lot of this, a lot of these things are all interconnected somehow um, on Earth. Whether it's UFOs, if it's paranormal or supernatural cryptids, I think it's all connected somehow. I don't have all the answers, but in my mind, I feel that it is. That's my opinion. So. Not exactly a UFO or Bigfoot story, but we're talking, we're going into my mid-20s. I My first of two experiences with sleep paralysis. Um, some of it, I can't say it's attributed to either demons or attributed to UFOs. I don't know, but I, let, I'll bring you this story where I spent the night at my mother's. And I by that day, I had, I had a girlfriend as well. And I stayed with her for a little while until we had you know enough money to put a deposit to you know, um, rent a home or an apartment, whatever it was at the time. So long story short on this one particular night, I was asleep in my bed and it's one of those things. And, and you all know, you know, the difference between being in a dream and a difference between being in some sort of different, um, existence sort of, sort of say, so as I'm waking up, I am unable to move. So I see the full room, but it's dark. 
My girlfriend's on the side, dead asleep, could not wake up. Only thing I can move was my head. As I'm moving my head, I'm barely able to speak. I see this apparition, this creature, right over, hovering over me, closer to the foot of the bed. And is the description I can give you is this. It was like a mini black tornado or real dark eyes, not human eyes, with big hands like this. So if you were to take a fist, like mallets, I was unable to move. Every time this creature put his hands up and he hit this way, my oxygen escaped from me. And it would do it repeatedly. Eventually, I kind of passed out, came to me a few minutes later, and nothing. I was covered in sweat, and I could finally move. But my limbs felt like, uh, compared to when your hands fall asleep, you're, you're, but it was all over, all over. Everything was asleep almost. I could barely move them. In the morning later on, I was a little upset with her. It was a little bit unfair to her because I say, hey, uh, why didn't you help me and wake up? She goes, what are you talking about? I go, I was kind of pushing you a little bit. You would not wake up, but this is what happened. And uh, that was my first experience, at least with sleep paralysis. And then ever since then, there's been experiences to where I've had entities and no matter where I live, usually mimic the sound of a person that's living there with me. And I'm having full-blown conversations with something that I thought was that person, but that person was waiting on the side of the house, but it would mimic the conversation, the, the voice and the mannerisms of whoever I was there with. Very strange. And this has even been ramped up even more now. Now in my later years, and especially when I moved to this new house here in West Virginia, it's been very strong. This house is very, has a lot of um energy like that right now. Um, so describe that energy to me. Sure. It's, um, I've never felt this, I'm not going to say the worrisome, but I never felt this alerted in any home I ever lived in now. Ever since I moved from Puerto Rico, I moved to Arlington, Virginia. There's always been something following, mostly because I believe there's a family history with this. But it was dormant for so long, but it came real present sort in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and now into later years. This home, pretty much immediately after we moved in, it has some sort of weird occurrences or I want to say dark energy, but it's almost an energy like you're just so defeated coming into this house. Um one of the things was, is during when we were in closing for the house, you know, get the key, sign the contracts, so you can tell that the person was there, the seller, seemed very nervous and it had a napkin that would have been twisted like a thousand times. And we asked all the questions, you know, everything's good with the house, of course, a walkthrough looked good, taxes are paid, because yeah, yeah, everything's great, everything's great. Meanwhile, she's sweating and nervous. I didn't really think much of it at the time. I was already tired. We were already tired of the move. We come in this house. And immediately, almost immediately, things started happening. One instance is the same thing I said earlier one night to where the door opens in my room. And there's this thing that says, hurry up, we're going to be late for work. Mimicking my my wife's voice. I'm getting up, start brushing my teeth. Holy crap, I'm going to be late, I'm going to be late to work. But it's 1.15 in the morning. I look at the clock. It's like, why is she telling me it's time to go to work? Go back to sleep. I explain to her, why did you why did you wake me up? Tell me it's go to work. I, said, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't move. And I for sure saw that door open and close um, with someone telling me in her own voice, hurry up, we're going to be late for work. This is one of several things that happened. I started, a friend of mine said, start journaling these experiences which I started doing. The problem with that is that every time I start journaling some things, things just stop. And then it goes to her. And she wasn't a believer until we moved into this home where now we, there's been instances where objects are on top of a cabinet or the refrigerator will get hurled towards their head. Um, photo and photo frames that are screwed on the walls will jump at her. So it's one of those things too. I don't know what it is in this house. But apparently it's 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 gone from me and now it's mad with her. I don't understand it. But it's Do you know anything about the history of the house itself? No, I you know, and maybe I should have asked those questions like that. But 
interesting enough, we started making friends with neighbors and a set of neighbors started talking and said, yeah, we just moved into this house. And they go, oh, that house. I go, yeah. He goes, oh, well, let me tell you a little something about what happened with this house. So I'm already intrigued when they say, oh, that house, right? You start thinking, oh, what's wrong with it? So the real long shot on that is it was a super happily married couple that all of a sudden, one day, husband leaves, moves way across the country, leaves the house, leaves the kid with the house, didn't take any furniture, any clothes, gone. So he left the burden on her to sell the house, get rid of all the stuff that was here. And uh, according to the neighbors, there's a lot of weird um, activity or behaviors, not that they're anything, they were doing anything wrong. But it kind of explains as to why the rush, because they were in this house less than two years, and why they rushed to sell it and, and getting the hell out of town. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think there's definitely something here, which brings me to my second experience. And this is the first time I'm telling you this, because other than my wife, I haven't told anybody, which happened to me last week here. And it, it was a little more intense than the first time I had it. And excuse me, I'm so last week I'm laying in bed as normal and my dog's very happy as can be. I wake up, and like I said, I know the difference between a dream and reality. And yet again, I could not move. I could only move my head. I could arch a little bit in my back, and there is something that was pinning me down, keeping me from moving. My arms hurt so bad and my muscles were hurting because it felt like something was putting full force on me. All of a sudden, actually, I'm able to talk, but, and I can't repeat the things on this show, which I said that night, but I, I had a very interesting choice of words I was shouting out because of my displeasure and, you know, it was painful experience. Next thing I know, and maybe this might be tied to a UFO part or not, I'll leave that up to the listeners and, and to you to judge. My dog never says or moves anything. I can see my dog just looking at the door, but he's not asleep. And it's like nothing's going on. So I'm thinking this is happening outside of the physical reality. A few minutes later, I pass out, but I wake up again. I have, We have a lot of farmland here. There's, there's cows. I have people that have llamas down the road. It's very beautiful out here in the mountains. And I see myself floating almost like I'm in a, in a gurney of some sorts through farmland and I can see the woods. I can't see any entities around me, but I'm floating flat. And I kind of lift my head up to look to the right. You know, I can see it's farmland and maybe in what I can best describe as a sort of tall wolfish figure. I can't see it, but I can see it's, it's back as it's walking like this. And so almost like a gal, but I knew that was that because I can, if you were living in my town, if you could come visit here or any listener or viewer of this show, I could tell you exactly which piece of land it was because that's where it happened. And this was around maybe 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning. And then next thing I know, right back in my bed, covered in, in ungodly amounts of sweat. And uh, I wake up and I'm able to walk, but my dog unfazed, my wife unfazed. So it's one of those. So there, there's either there's some sort of things been following me. So I was three to six years old, came here, or this whole house has something, something new that's happening here that I've never experienced. Not to that extent to where now I'm no longer in the bed, but I'm actually out of my house. Well, is there a correlation between that experience at six and this court and this experience? I don't know. That's a great question. But what I could tell you is that the older I get, the more intense these experiences are. So if if I can go back, if you don't mind, I can go back to around when I was three years old, two, three years old, before I came here to the United States, living in Puerto Rico. I remember, this, this is interesting how my memory works sometimes, because back then, they used to have these gigantic cribs for, for the children, right? And they're almost look like um, mini cells, um, but I was kind of funny little guy I used to climb over and sneak out of it. But my mom put me back in anyway. So 
in that apartment or the condos back then in Puerto Rico, there was always these experiences I had to where when my door was closed, I could see shadow feet underneath and hear voices. Now I cannot determine what these voices were saying because it sounded like it was like a crowd of people. Um, I didn't know what language it was. It was, I could not understand what it was saying. This happened quite often. And I never told my mom because at that age, you really don't know how to explain anything. It kind of sounds like gibberish, especially coming from a three-year-old, a two-year-old. Fast forward a couple years later, my mother left get a job in the United States, make a better life for us. And she did a great job doing that. But I was a solid year with my grandmother's house and my grandmother's house or apartment. I'm sorry. That's not a house. We're on the third floor. There was an, a wall that divided the apartment buildings from homes. So there's one particular home right over the, um, the wall, the concrete wall that you never saw anybody come and go there. There was a lot of overgrowth with the yard and trees, very poorly kept. Every time during a certain time of the afternoon, really loud music would play out of nowhere. And it was very loud. And it would always play the same song over and over again, right about the same time of the day, over and over again. And people laugh when I tell them the name of the song because it's actually it's an ABBA song. And one of the ABBA songs they sing in Spanish. And over and over and over again, eventually, my mother comes back to you. Puerto Rico, we moved to the United States, um, to Arlington, Virginia, not too far from Washington, D.C. We move into a, a duplex. And every once in a while, things also started happening there. One night, I think I was around five or six years old, and um, everybody's asleep. Now, we all slept in mattresses because, you know, we were just starting out life. So we used to go and uh, wait for people to throw away trash. And then sometimes a great furniture, but we had no mattresses. So we took what we had. We slept on the floors. One night, again, I'm the only one awake. Everybody's fast asleep. And this is why I don't understand why it's one of those things where I can be awake, but no, everybody else is asleep and they won't wake up. I start walking around the town. There's a little, little teeny time house. And uh, I start hearing that song play. Loud as can be. Now, we didn't have a radio. We had a black and white TV at best. But um, playing the same song from ABBA. And I'm sitting there in the stairwell with my little hands over my ears because I couldn't take the sound anymore of that song. So then as any bright kid would do, I would go downstairs to try to investigate what's going on here. And uh, didn't see anything, but the song kept playing. And then, you know, that I, I think there's something to it. Um, but to this day, if I hear that song, I'll change, I'll change the station because I'm not hearing it. It makes me nervous, tell you the truth, you know. I can imagine. Yes, it would. Exactly. So when you're moving and, and you're living now just in Arlington, um, anything else happened while you were there besides this? Not at that place. It, it, it was almost it was like a, a long gap between um that time and then maybe something may or may not have happened, but I didn't really... I wasn't really drawn to it. It, it almost like I outgrew it or it outgrew me. And it wasn't until my twenties where, when then this thing did a boomerang and just came back into my life. And ever since then it's been pretty much, it seems like the older I get, the more intense this becomes. It takes little breaks, but like I said, like now it's, it's even more prol prolific. Is that even a word? It's, it happens more than ever now, especially now with, with, with my wife. And I think it's a, uh, whatever anger it has is now leashed onto her. But, um, you know, yeah, it's one of those things we're dealing with currently. And I, we haven't had anybody come cleanse the house or bless the house yet. I think we're long overdue if that's something that we didn't want to do. And uh, yeah, so last week, so you're the first one I told that story. And uh, yeah, no, pretty intense stuff. Exactly. You know, I did a UFO research trip back, oh, I don't know, several years ago to Puerto Rico. And we interviewed a lot of people who had had UFO and alien contact experiences down there. But the attitude was so different than it is in the United States. I mean, that was just kind of a matter of fact way of life. Um, they had uh, entities or beings that would, you know, just walk into a church service that they were having. They, they had craft that would just land on their lawns as if, you know, and they didn't they didn't give it the same kind of um, 
attention that we give it because it was just like a normal thing. And here, you know, it's, it's all the questions if they even exist or not. And it, it was just such a different attitude. Have you found those two cultures to be very different? Yes. No, that's, that's a great observation. Um, because it's one of those things. And this is my opinion, because it depends on what side of the aisle you fall on. Outside of the United States, or well, I guess the UK too, because they've been having an increase with UFO stuff over there. And I think they treat it a lot like we do here in the United States. Americans, we're too busy to really care about things like that. We got other things going on. And even though it's been in the American culture, prior to American culture and Native American culture prior to them, there's always been something going on here and it's on this continent. And I think the reason is different is because some of these cultures have the time and they're a little, they don't move as fast as us as, as far as our attention to detail is concerned. And I think that you're right they don't have an opinion that this could have a day. And for them, it's a matter of fact, because they've seen it. And it's something that I think they've grown up with their whole time, their whole life. And the stories get passed on, but you'll notice too, that when you speak to people in certain countries, they're more open to tell you their experiences. Like, oh yeah, this is what happened. This is talk to him. He could tell you a lot more about this um, here. Sometimes I think it's out of fear of being ridiculed or it's, we won't believe till we see, but even if we see it, we're, we're the first thing we say, oh, that's fake or is a hoax, but most likely it's not. Right, exactly. Um, and it, it's, um, you know, and in part, I don't know if, you know, like you said, we're very busy here in the U.S., but also I think there's a way that we grow up and we learn how to perceive the world and and maybe we're just not even paying attention to that part of the world um, or th their existence. I agree. I think um, at least this, I can only speak for the United States. I've, I've really only been to two countries and not only are we busy, but we're too distracted. And I think we're distracted on purpose to get our eyes up of what things could be happening because we're, we're distracted with entertainment, sports and others. Not that there's anything wrong with any of that, but I think we're, we're too busy with that. We're not really paying attention to what really is going on on this planet. It's kind of a shame really, but I think that's something like that. I think it might be changing now with the more and more uh, documentaries and shows are on TV, especially about this subject. I think there's an increase of interest in these subjects and hopefully that'll be more digestible now in case people come out and tell these stories. But just it's just as you know, and the rest of the um, interesting guests you've had, you have to really weed out some of these stories to make sure nobody's trying to put a sham over your, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and uh, I, I don't even know how you can find that out. I mean, people just tell a story and you just don't know when they're telling the truth or when they're just making it up. And, you know, I haven't figured out a, a magic way to to do that. Right, me neither. Not without hurting somebody's feelings. You don't really want to do that either, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't know that I have enough um, information to really discern that particularly well. I mean, there are people that I've interviewed that, of course, there is, you know, a certain body language and certain ways that they tell a story that you question, you know, if that's going to be, if that's really an honest answer or not, or if their story changes in the middle of <laughs> midstream, that's also a good sign. Um, but otherwise, you know, I just don't know even how we, we know for sure. Um, but you said that you'd learned a lot. And one of your missions here uh, doing all of this is because you want to have some explanation of all this. Um, tell me some things that you've learned in your journey here. I, I love the question because and I'll try to answer the best I can, but I'm not one of those. I'm, I'm not a great intellectual and I don't retain a lot of information here. I write down a lot of things and I you know, say I journal, but here's one of the things I've learned. I come from a Christian background and I have a lot of Pentecostal roots when it comes to my Christian faith. Um, and I've learned that it's okay to step outside of those boundaries and try to find other information, not because I question the faith, but because if there are things happening that may not be necessarily be able to be answered by the church, that it's, it's okay. You're not going to be getting any kind of trouble seeking out this information or seeking out answers outside of the church. And it kind of, it makes me feel better about that, but it's... 
yeah, I mean, I, that's the best way I can explain it because at one point it's like, do, do I delve into this? And if I do, am I doing something wrong? You really aren't because funny enough, there are a lot now with the church. And when I say the church, I'm only strictly talking about a Christian or a Protestant side of it, where these subjects are now being talked about in the church in the actual physical building and on side groups to where I think now it's people feel better because maybe they can put a, they can put a face or they can put a, um, some sort of answer to the questions that they had that's happening to them. And hopefully they're not scared to ask for help or for more information. So I'm not really sure that my show can do that for others. I know that's helping me on my journey, but if anything or anyone that I interview or any information that I put out there helps somebody or put someone on a journey to where they can get answers or feel better about their situation, that's all the better. Well, I think, uh, I think that's true. And I do think that when, People hear a story they can identify with, and they do understand they're not isolated out there alone, having those experiences that can't always be explained rationally in our mm -hmm. world. Um, I think that can be a very therapeutic process. I 100% agree with you on that. So, you know, I appreciate you're doing that. I appreciate you um, you being a resource for a lot of people to tell their stories and, and be able to, to get information out to, to other people as well. Um, is there anything else you'd like to discuss? You know, it's, it's if anyone has any questions or would like to reach out, you know, I'm always open. Um, I have a weird schedule. Uh, I'm a super early bird. But if anybody has any stories they'd like to share or if they want to talk to somebody that I can put them in contact with to help them with their situation, I'll be more than happy to help anybody along with their journey or whatever questions they have. But as, as far as sharing, you know, I appreciate you letting me come on your show. You know, and I'll say I was a little intimidated at first because um, yeah, I'm a big fan of what you do, and uh, I'm also a big fan of the people you've interviewed as well. Um, some of those folks that I've listened to in the past as well, that give me a little more confidence into the journey that I'm on, that I'm not on the wrong path. Um, but if anything, if, if I can bring any subject up or anything, just don't be afraid to talk about these things in my opinion, it's unhealthy to keep it inside because then you're you're going to get more of it if you don't deal with it. True. And and also, I think that um, when you, once you start sharing your stories, you may find out that a lot of other people have similar stories. Um, that's what I found when I first started doing the UFO research, especially just by bringing up the subject, people that I'd known for years, even relatives, um, had never spoken about various sightings they'd had or experiences they'd ex had had. And, and suddenly they felt comfortable sharing it. So I think sometimes if you just open up the dialogue, people will come forth with their own experiences. Indeed true, my friend. And I, I'll, I'll leave you with this one. So going back to the whole ABBA thing, I, we had a surprise birthday party for my mother. It was one of those milestone birthdays that um, the whole family came. And then we're sitting around the table. There's about 20 of us there. I'll call us the, the, the original pack, the ones that first came here and to the United States from Puerto Rico. And we're all growing up now, having doing different things. I mentioned this story to my cousins that were there and my mother. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. All of a sudden, as I'm talking about this story, my, my one of my older cousins is more like a sister to me. We grew up together. We had a few years apart. She starts doing this number. She starts leaning over and saying, Repeat that again, what you just story you just told me. I go, yeah, the whole thing with the house. He goes, yeah, the house was there. Nobody ever went there. Yeah, there was overgrowth in that song play too. So it's not only me that I heard it. She also heard this too, because she's always been very in tune with this type of thing. And then, oh my goodness, 40 some years later, now I feel kind of better about it. It's like, see, I knew, I knew something happened. And then she definitely confirmed that. Wow. So you had confirmation that 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 song was coming from and there's no source for it. It's just plain. And um, well, that would be interesting. And that had to feel good to know that it, you weren't alone in that. Absolutely. And no, it's one of those things. I actually. My mother's birthday would have been the highlight, of course, but that right there is, is, is right there. It's like, wow. So finally. My journey's worth it. Now I have an answer so that I can move on to the next thing, you know. 
Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up our interview. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, I've really appreciated all the, the information that you've shared and the experiences that you shared with us. And uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. It's been an honor being on your show. Okay. I'll, I'll let you know when this comes out. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.